Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best macro analysis to help you successfully invest in financial markets. For our latest analysis, visit macrohive.com. Markets can be fickle and appear to have shrugged off any risks from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. We'll see how long that indifference lasts. And in the meantime, all eyes have been on the Fed, which just recently hiked interest rates. The first of what are likely to be many interest rate increases. Dominique Dwarfico writes a piece on what this means for the US economy. And also we updated our US recession indicator, which uses the yield curve. And it continues to show a high probability of a recession in the next 12 months. For equity investors, we look at whether European banks are attractive to invest. The picture looks very interesting. On crypto, we look at whether the Fed's hike could actually be bullish for Bitcoin. Then on the educational side, we have an explainer on how the European Union is defining what energy sources are green or not, which then has an implication for green investments. To get access to all of these insights, simply become a member at macrohive.com. With membership, you can get access to all of our analysis and updates, our webinars, transcripts, and our member Slack room, where you can interact with the MacroHive research team and other members all hours of the day. Membership to MacroHive costs the same as a few weekly cappuccinos. So go to macrohive.com and sign up now. Then if you're a professional or institutional investor, we have a more high octane product that features all of my and the MacroHive research team's views, our moral portfolio, trade ideas, machine learning models, and much, much more. Hit me up on Bloomberg or email me on bilal at macrohive.com. That's bilal, B-I-L-A-L at macrohive.com to find out more. Now, a word from the sponsors of this episode, Masterworks. Are you worried about inflation? Perhaps you should be. Every month, inflation is reaching new highs, 6.2%, 6.5%, and most recently, 7.2% in the US. That's how much more food, electricity, and housing is costing these days. And if you're anything like us, now may be time to consider alternatives. Why alternatives? Well, for starters, a survey last year conducted by Motley Fool revealed that ultra-high net worth investors had 50% of their portfolio in alternatives on average. We're talking about portfolios valued at over $1 billion. But one alternative that nobody seems to be talking about is fine art. That's because up until now, you've had to have millions to own fine art. But that's not the case anymore. Thanks to Masterworks, they let you purchase shares that represent an investment in famous artworks. Pieces from masters like Warhol and Banksy at a more approachable price point. You can go to masterworks.io forward slash macro to skip the line and join over 300,000 members already on Masterworks. That's masterworks.io forward slash macro. See important regulation aid disclosures and the offering circular at masterworks.io at masterworks.io forward slash about forward slash disclosure. Now, on to this episode's guest, Andy Constan. Andy has spent the past 33 years investing and trading global markets. He's worked at top hedge funds, including Bridgewater Associates and Brevin Howard. And Andy started his career at Salomon Brothers. Now, on to our conversation. So welcome, Andy. It's great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this for a while now. Oh, thanks, Bilal. Pleasure to be here. Great. And as usual, before we jump into the meat of our discussion, I always like to ask my guests something about their origin story. So, you know, where did what did you study? Where was it inevitable you'd end up in finance? And how did you end up where you are today? Well, I studied uh, uh, biomechanical engineering at University of Pennsylvania. And uh, no, I had no intention of, of coming to Wall Street and spending my time in finance. I wanted to be a doctor. But my um, grandfather was a neurosurgeon and his brothers were doctors. And one of them pulled me aside um, during college and said, you don't want to be a doctor um, <laughs> because um, he had, you know, he had a lot of things with uh, malpractice insurance and the changing dynamics back then about how healthcare was going to work. I still, you know, think about that decision and what it could have meant to helping people, but um, you know, I'm happy doing what I've done. And that happened because um, of the fraternity I was in and the close friends I developed there, a couple of which had sort of had a, had a birth story that was destined to Wall Street. It was also the time, you know, 86 was when spreadsheets really had become invented the pri- in a couple of years prior. And so quantitative analysis of corporate finance deals was a bit, was all of a sudden a thing, whereas it had been entirely relationship and less by the numbers. Now everyone had a discounted cash flow analysis or a LBO model or whatever. And um, 
they needed young people to crunch those numbers. And so uh, they started hiring aggressively and I wanted to live in New York by that time and um, joined Solomon Brothers. And okay, that's where you started. There, you started presumably as a as a junior, as a grad, and I, you know, which which yeah. department was it? It was in the corporate finance department. I was doing. Um, I was in their analytical section, which was the ones who um, were called in for more complicated analysis. Um, there were a bunch of there was two departments like that: mergers and acquisitions, which focused on that very narrow section, and then all the other potential. Um, needs of a in, of a company um, were done by my area, um, and then there was the whole relationship team that actually managed the relationship with the client. And so we would be called in for, you know, plus pluses and minuses of a particular style of issuance, convertible bonds versus equity versus debt, things like of that nature, and also try to model more complex problems. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that was where I joined and um, I really started, you know, excelled there. Thankfully, it was fun. Um, worked crazy hours, like they say. I think I um, was at the firm for the entire month of February in 1987 um, and many all nighters and, you know, that whole thing. And so that was fun. Um, but I also um, had the blessing of being invited to. Um, be Solomon's representative on the Brady Commission after the stock market crashed. And that really um, generated the thirst I've kept about solving um, since then, about solving um, what happened in markets and what could happen. Okay, yeah, understood. And so you spent a number of years on the sell side, um, but then eventually you moved to the buy side. So how did that transition happen? So throughout my career, um, Solomon was a very, you know, was a market maker in lots of different things. I was on the convertible bond trading desk. And during that period of time, there was, um, you know, a big question of where proprietary trading should happen. Uh, Solomon had its ARB group, which focused in fixed income, but everywhere in the firm from the high yield desk to the convertible desk to the derivatives desk, even the equity desk would have, um, you know, a fair amount of their PL would be associated not with market making, but with um, proprietary trading. And so I've been proprietary trading ever since. And, you know, the natural place to do that eventually is in a hedge fund. Um, a number of my um, colleagues started long term capital, and I knew those guys extremely well and thought about, you know, asking them to hire me during the mid 90s. Uh, but my career was taking off at that point in time. And it was always a goal to do what I do um, proprietarily at Solomon um, for uh, in the hedge fund industry. And then it was just a matter of timing from then. And that happened 2003. Um, a bunch of my friends in the fixed income area um, decided that they wanted to start a hedge fund. and. Um, the equity area at Solomon at that point was dealing with the um, post um, uh, tech bubble and more importantly, the um, Spitzer led questioning of how equity research is handled and paid for and for whom is it really for? Is it for investors or is it for um, sourcing corporate finance relationships. Um, and um, that created a bad dynamic for equities, which on the back of the financial, the, um, the tech bubble was already dealing with uh, more automated trading, uh, lower commissions, lower volumes, and higher costs because the investment banks were no longer allowed to pay any portion or control any portion of the, of the research budget. And so there was a lot of firing going on. Um, my equity, I was running global equity derivatives at the time, um, and my business was actually flourishing, um, doing extremely well because of a variety of mergers and the talented people we brought together in the late 90s, um, and also good environment for derivatives. And um, I looked at my next job, which would be my boss's job, which was running global equities and realized that was a job I'd never want. 
Um, and so that really said, at the same time as my friends were starting a hedge fund, I would, um, I didn't want my next job at Solomon. And so I uh, chose to join them. Yeah. And then how did you find uh, the difference between prop trading at a sell side institution versus trading or being a portfolio manager at a hedge fund? You know, were, were there differences or was it the same? So I would describe it differently because we were, the prop trading was part of the daily function of market making um, because it wasn't separate from the customer business at yeah. Solomon, except in certain, a very specific area, um, is that um, you were constantly active, making markets as well as holding inventory and managing your inventory and constantly busy. Um, and it actually, because you were collecting the bid offer spread, it paid for you to be busy. Um, when I joined the sell side, the buy side, and I think this is true of many, many traders I've seen through the years when they go from the sell side to the buy side, particularly those who go from sales to trading, um, which is a common occurrence as well, because they have the relationship typically with the hedge fund that they join. Um, is that when you sit in a hedge fund seat, you are bombarded with information from people who want you to trade. Um, and sell side people like to trade and be active. But in this case, they're now paying the bid offer spread. Yeah. And so the biggest um, challenge, which I overcame in a very concrete way um, is uh, to try not to answer the phone and to not <laughs> okay. trade. Yeah. Um, the information is useful that these people send you, but it is um, in itself um, an intoxicant to trade. And so, you know, I took active steps to avoid trading, essentially. Things like going on a long run at 11 a.m. Um, and then having a lunch and then, you know, getting back on the desk and, you know, having a thousand messages or a hundred messages and um, responding to none of them um, because it simply isn't a good use of my time. Um, and counting on certain people who I ended up trading with fairly actively when I did trade for to be a filter, a self filter for what's useful to me. So that I got to know the sell side well, but made some um, close relationships with salespeople who knew what I wanted and didn't waste my time. So I think that's the biggest thing. Okay, no, no, yeah. I... The, second, the second biggest thing is um, personally, so as a proprietary trader at Solomon and as a hedge fund CIO and um, founding partner at two different funds, um, RV trading strategies, which is what I was doing, are both at Solomon and at my hedge funds, have a have far more macro and beta like um, risks than um, I think most people realize when they start out in in the um, in the uh, RV space. And so when, when macro is doing a certain thing like tightening um, and leverage is be, and markets are being delevered, it hits RV relationships very, very hard. And so in 2008, um, we had just launched a new fund. I had, we had closed our, my original partnership broke and we closed our original fund and a few of us started a new fund. <clears throat> We started at bad timing, so it never really got off the ground with funding. Uh, we had a, a seed investor, but by the time we started, there was literally nobody um, allocating money because the financial crisis had started. Um, but what I saw is all of these relationships that I would have thought would have been great relationships to do RV um, acted like beta and were had huge drawdowns, things like, um, you know, there's the classic trade was um, 
um, Citadel famously was long a whole bunch of cash corporate bonds and had bought protection at much lower, at, at below the cost of, of the coupons that they were receiving from the bonds. So essentially had a bona fide arbitrage and they'd simply hold the thing and collect it. Collect it. But during the financial crisis, no one could hold cash bonds. No one would let you do repo on cash corporate bonds. Um, and um, those cash corporate bonds started falling and the CDS didn't because those didn't have um, any collateral problems. And so corporate bonds traded at one point, you know, you could get pick up 400 basis points on a perfectly credit risk covered transaction. Now, part of that was the counterparty risk, but the spread had gotten astoundingly large during that period of time. And it just tells you that when margin calls are happening, RV is not immune. And yeah, so that, yeah. that really made me think that my, the next set of learnings I wanted to do was understand macro. And that's um, the reason I joined Bridgewater. And so you, you went on to join Bridgewater and then uh, Brevin later as well. I mean, what, huh? what, what, you know, they're obviously two very prestigious, you know, uh, hedge funds. I mean, what, what, what were the main things you learned from, from those organizations? And they all have very distinctive cultures as well. Sure. Um, and I learned amazing things from both. It was really a great um, place, place set of places to really perfect my understanding of macro. Um, Let's start by saying I've always been on a journey from the early, the mid eighties to the late eighties till, till today in comparing systematic trading strategies with uh, discretionary trading strategies. And my vision has been that there is no uh, discretionary trader who if really pushed and shoved could, and it's, it's very hard and it's not easy to do, but is anything more than a systematic trader. They follow rules, they identify things in the world, they compare them to how things happened in the past and make connections to a particular worldview at the moment and what is likely to happen. Um, and so Ray Dalio used to say that his vision was um, to have um, computers do that function. And essentially, what he wanted the computers to do is identify today um, the snapshot of what's going on in the world in pricing and economic conditions, <laughs> recognizing that he was doing it with data, which provided a pixelated version of the picture, um, a George Surratt impressionistic picture. Um, and his job was to fill in as many dots as possible so that he could um, see what's going on and then use computers to compare those dots with prior dots and what subsequently happened after those, when those dots aligned. And so he could compare today with past pictures through history and then look at those past pictures and see what outcomes occurred. And that's what a systematic trader does. It's constantly looking to refine the dots and get a clearer picture. And what I think about when I think about a discretionary trader, um, a discretionary trader is analog, sees the world as it is in its full vibrancy, color, depth, and focus. Um, and so doesn't miss, doesn't have any problem with missing dots that he just hadn't got around to putting in his pixelated picture, the, the, the systematic guy's pixelated picture. He sees it all. What he has trouble doing is that it's very difficult to compare an analog picture to a prior analog picture because there's no way a computer can help you with that. So he has to use his brain to compare those things. And that's something that's complicated, but you know, the great discretionary traders of which Alan is one of is able to do that. Um, and so really everyone's just trying to figure out what the picture of is, is, whether it's an analog picture with its vibrancy or a pixelated picture with as much of the image as you can get and compare it to history. And history doesn't re necessarily repeat, but in some way get some grounding for the future because alpha is predicting the future. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I got. I've been thinking about that my entire career and watching Bridgewater build the pixelated 
way to trade markets in a purely systematic way. <clears throat> and Alan, in a purely discretionary way, um, having his own great success um, was probably the biggest learnings I had in working at those firms. And so now in terms of your process, you, you kind of implied earlier that there, there is a way to systematize discretionary views, or are you saying that you have to run both in parallel and, 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 and kind of combine them somehow? I think there's a theoretical way. I don't think anyone's done it. Okay. And I certainly haven't. Um, I think what you have to do is respect what you can get from each. Yeah. And that I'm not, whereas Bridgewater is religious about it and Brevin is religious about it, I'm not. I'm agnostic about what tool I use and use them both. Yeah. And you mentioned alpha earlier, which kind of brings on the question of beta, you know, where, you know, we hear about a 60-40 portfolio, or we hear about all weather portfolios, you know, some version of kind of being long the market in some sort of combination of assets. Um, and then, you know, so that should that form the core of your investment, and then you have, you know, alpha on top of that, or um, do you look at things differently? So I definitely believe that um, owning assets in a diversified way with a, um, you know, balancing whatever risks you can get balance, whether diversify away country risk, diversify away security selection risk, diversify away importantly, and this is the um, all weather concept, um, diversify away exposures that you don't have a view on through time, like growth or inflation in particular, which are the principal drivers, um, is the best way to make money over the long term. And there are some challenges to that view right at the moment with um, one of the key uh, security types providing um, not providing what it used to provide in terms of exposures, and that's bond, mar bond markets globally. They're just, our bonds have always been a good um, anti-growth asset, um, and you need anti-growth ass assets because the 60-40 portfolio itself, but, e but certainly equities on its own, are pro-growth. And so it's always been useful to own an anti-growth asset like bonds. And they're just, um, unfortunately, bond prices won't rally as much as they did um, in past environments when there is an anti-growth shift. Um, a recession in Europe is just going, not going to rally the Bund enough to protect the DAX. Same in Japan. The US is a little better off. Yeah, I mean, on, on that then, I mean, what, what do you then do when you don't have that anti-growth asset, does that mean you have to, you know, leverage that, question. you know, bonds in some form, derivatize it to kind of, you know, you know, try to try to get some, you know, greater exposure or do you just have to, um, you know, put your money in cash or something? Yeah, I mean, that's the challenge. Um, when you have a portfolio that has a lower risk adjusted return, which is the portfolio you're describing in which, you know, let, let's keep before, there are lots of ways to tweak your exposures using derivatives. I, I think for a portfolio that's designed to be long-term and passive, that's probably not the right thing to do. You're paying transaction costs. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. But let's just stick with the idea that um, you have a portfolio that's not as balanced as it used, used to be. And what that means is it's not as it doesn't have um, the same expected return for the amount of risk. The, the, return, the expected return can be the same, but the amount, and it should be, but the amount of risk has changed. Um, and so there's a very simple logic to that, take less risk. Um, unfortunately, we're in a world in which um, less risk means more uh, cash. And um, in such a world, um, when you have inflation, um, that cash wastes away. Um, so we are in a very tricky time where both interest rates are very, very low and inflation is very, very high. Um, um, and so I don't have a simple answer to what you do, but without a doubt, the right first, the first um, principle is to reduce risk. Yeah. And so 
I think what's interesting about that, and I'll just take a, a tangential point to that, is um, Japan, Japanese investors, simply don't have a portfolio that they can, and, uh, that is adequately anti-growth um, or meaning balanced. They have plenty of pro-growth assets, but they have no anti-growth assets. And similarly, the, U the um, European continent has no balanced portfolio. And so, <coughs> Um, that puts a strong wind on the U.S. dollar because Europeans want to take risks because they want the return, but they need balance. And so you go to the place that has balance and that remains with, you know, 30 year bonds nearing two and a half percent that remains the U.S. dollar asset market. And so I believe a lot of the strength in the Euro, Euro sorry, in the US dollar versus the Euro and versus the Yen have been those sort of investor flows, both domestic US persons selling their non-US exposure and um, Europeans and Japanese buying US exposure. And both of those flows are more powerful than trade flows and faster moving. And that's caused a, some you know, strength in the US dollar. Um, and I think while the massacre in Chinese um, internet stocks is ongoing. Um, China represents a um, country that is um, that has no need to um, um, has plenty of ammunition and is more balanced from a monetary and fiscal policy, and has assets that are priced quite attractively for balance for a balanced portfolio. Unfortunately, you have to deal with the political risk, but um, that's an interesting market right now. And I think part of the CNY strength has been both trade and investment flows trying to squeeze into that market. Um, we continue to buy from them and that's the trade flows and that's strengthening um, um, Remimbi. Um, but we also are, the world is looking for a balance in their investments and that's, you know, available there with some, again, some significant risk premium associated with politics. And, and in terms of China there, obviously you have the equity side, you know, which has some challenges, regulatory risk, political risk and so on, but also the bonds, you know, which have yields that are higher than the US is in both in nominal and real terms. So, you right. know, which right, is great. You, yeah, which is great, of course. So are you, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about how China stocks are very attractive. I mean, do you think that's a value trap and really the better investment is really bonds in China? So uh, I'm agnostic on bonds versus stocks as it okay. relates to data. Okay. As it relates to alpha, that's the whole completely different discussion. Okay. But yeah. as it relates to beta, I'm agnostic. I want balance. Yeah. And so if I were to add assets to an all-weather portfolio, that's one place you can do it. And um, again, diversify so that you have less country risk. But, um, you know, that's one location that has a balanced portfolio of growth and anti-growth and pro and anti-inflation assets. So that, that seems interesting to me. And a currency that is unlikely to be, um, uh, is heading in the direction Ray thinks it's sooner than later, actually, um, heading in the direction of um, at least competing with the US dollar as a reserve currency. And those are very attractive things, um, absent the, what I think is fascinating and interesting news on the um, last few weeks of, last few months of Chinese internet stocks and all the political and regulatory hassles. And you, you, know, you mentioned how US bonds are relatively more attractive because obviously the nominal yields are higher. Does it matter that inflation is much higher in the US than it is in Europe and Japan? I mean, does that affect your idea of the balanced portfolio or, or, I, or do you look at things in nominal terms? Um, so, so yes, of course that matters. Um, it's sensitivity to rising inflation is probably um, um, based on inflation expectations is probably fairly well priced. I mean, you got 10 year inflation expectations 
expectations that are approaching 3%. Um, most of that's driven by the front, but still. Um, and so, yeah, I think it respond, uh, those bonds would respond well to falling or rising inflation expectations. Um, obviously not, um, tips is a very important part of a uh, balanced portfolio as well. And so, you know, those respond to inflation going up, for instance. Yeah. And then, um, then on, on the on the alpha side, you know, you, you mentioned earlier the systematic approach. So, you know, the core of systematic tends to be some kind of carry strategy of, you know, depending which asset class you're in, then there's momentum and value. These are kind of the core sure. blocks. I mean, do you think that their um, efficacy still works in, you know, in, in, in kind of a low yield world or has something changed? Yeah, so, I, so, I, so um, there are a lot of uh, alpha streams. Um, okay. When I think of, so that, and, and those, those alpha streams that you just mentioned are um, very well picked over in the CTA world and um, amongst many systematic macro. I think of it more at a, uh, um, a longer term horizon. And so of course, having a momentum indicator is useful for, for it's sort of table stakes. Um, but I think it takes more than that to make alpha in markets. And so um, you need to have um, an understanding of the linkages between um, various data, whether it's GDP or CPI or any of the more micro, um, idiosyncratic data and the asset class um, that you're comparing. Bridgewater, and my, I, I, this is why I fit well with that culture, wasn't big on, um, and we'll see, um, wasn't big on, um, on uh, data mining, taking streams of data, comparing them to streams of asset prices and finding the ones that best co get cobbled together using whatever technique from basic regressions to, um, artificial intelligence approaches, whatever it was, some tool to find the best fit of those things. Um, Bridgewater just, and I think it's, again, it's just what you're comfortable with, I'm comfortable with. Um, I like to see um, causes and then use data to identify if those causes are valid. And so I spend almost all of my time in in thinking about markets, trying to establish frameworks, understand the linkages and the data and then the, and the systematic approach comes from that, not from you know, big data um, um, libraries that I just compare. And so that's my approach. Um, I think it's useful. And what I'm saying is that there are many different um, things, causal drivers for market prices. There's flow in positioning. There's economic changes in economic data relative to consensus. There's a number, you know, you can rattle off many, many ones. And then there are very unusual market specific ones. I've been talking on my Twitter feed about mortgage convexity lately, um, driving, you know, um, um, you know, over overdriving rates down to 170 on 10s uh, a week ago and potentially driving them through to 215 today. Um, and that the equilibrium price is being affected by um, hedging activity. And so that's the signal. So you cobble all those things together and you have many signals and that gives you an, 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 a bet, an indicator. Yeah. <coughs> And you mentioned so mortgage my... convexity, just for the benefit of our listeners who aren't familiar with that concept. Can you just describe what mortgage convexity is and how it relates to bond, uh, sure. regular bonds? Sure, roughly. I mean, it's, it's, it's up to people to judge their own opinions. And mortgage convexity has shifted through the years as Fannie and Freddie um, were the dominant force to um, mortgage servicers becoming the dominant force. And that now 
the treasure, the U.S. Treasury owning um, a good portion of, sorry, the Fed owning a good portion of the mortgages and not hedging their convexity. But let's start from the base principle. A mortgage is something that in the U.S., which is, I think only Netherlands has this type of security. It's unique to the U.S. essentially. Um, you can pay off your mortgage at any time. And so, and they're 30 year fixed mortgages. So they are a very, very high duration asset, long-term bond that you can call away from the owner, the investor at any time for any reason. Um, people call them away um, in a non-economic sense when they sell their house and buy it and move to another state. Um, but in an economic sense, they, um, call away their mortgage when they refi. And so when does one refi? When interest rates are lower. So <clears throat> what happens to a mortgage in the US, a 30 year fixed rate mortgage is when interest rates fall, the um, investor who um, purchased the mortgage from the bank that the homeowner engaged to set the mortgage, all of a sudden has his 30 year bond um, turn into cash at very low interest rates. And that's a very bad thing for your, the duration of your portfolio. All of a sudden your portfolio goes from, and it doesn't happen like this, but from 20 years to zero years very quickly. And so at the macro level, when interest rates fall, mortgages get refinanced. And prior to that, everybody had as much duration, interest rate, long-term interest rate exposure as they desired. And then all, all of a sudden they didn't. So what that means is that the world now wants to buy more bonds. When interest rates rise and refis become less likely, the duration extends on these mortgages. And so the world of mortgage holders now have a portfolio that is longer duration, more interest rate exposure than they wanted. And so their natural job is to sell. So that's what negative convexity is. And that's how it affects the macro market in that when interest rates fall, the world wants to buy more bonds. That's at high prices. And when interest rates fall, arise, the world wants to sell more bonds, which are actually at low prices right now. And so that's called negative gamma, negative convexity and interest rates. And it tends to exacerbate, those flows tend to exacerbate rallies in bonds and sell-offs in bonds. Um, now you're talking about a 15 to $20 trillion market and a 25 basis point change can change the duration such that to neutralize, you may need to see a trillion of buying. Now the question then becomes, who does buy? Do, the Fed doesn't, the Fed just says, okay, you know, so my duration's changed. I'm not gonna do anything about it. Um, many mortgage funds who are clipping both credit out of the mortgage and the fact that they're paid a higher interest rate because they're short this call option, say, eh, we'll just, we won't rehedge. We won't do anything about it. We'll, markets, we, who knows? But there are economic interests that have, um, that are both levered and have tight PL restrictions, both because of the leverage and because of that, of, that's their business that they dynamically hedge that exposure. And so it's up to the reader, the, the viewer to figure out how much those flows are, but they can be sizable. And so um, that's something that, that I pay attention to. Yeah. So, so recent, in recent weeks, your, your sense is that you think this has been influencing some of the market moves. So, so you wouldn't necessarily extract too much of a a macro interpretation to some of these recent swings in bond yields? Oh, I, I think both are true. Yeah. You have to respect the macro. Uh, inflation expectations have certainly risen and for good reasons. Um, the thing that surprised me, I guess, is the um, extent of the rally 
once um, we hit around 185 on the 10 year. Going down to 167, I think was the low on tens, had to be, and then it reversing and retracing almost within two days, all the way back to 185, had to be some sort of um, short squeeze is one word you'd use, margin calls, another word you use, but it could simply be the activity of these hedgers. I don't know what the answer is, but something happened such that macro conditions didn't change from, they didn't change from 185 to 167 and back out to 215 in what has amounted to nine days. In my opinion, I could be wrong. That seems like more volatility than was due for the volatility of the um, macro conditions. And so yeah. I think it was something that accentuated those moves. And then how, how are you looking at the, the business cycle right now? We, you were recording this before the Fed meeting. Um, yeah. The Fed's expected to go 25. The market's pricing you know, quite a fair number of hikes over the course of this year, six or seven hikes. People are worried about inflation. There's a debate around you know, transitory or not to some extent. There's some murmurs of recessionary risks, uh, at least in Europe perhaps, you know, maybe even the US. H how are you seeing the cycle in general? I think we're at a very unusual time in which policymakers have um, what I would call a, um, they're on a knife's edge at some level, which is um, it's going to be very difficult to navigate over the next um, year. Um, I don't have a, um, I'm not, uh, a conspiracy theorist or a gold bug or a, um, I think these guys are, or, or, I, or I think the, the central banks have credibility. Um, they make mistakes, of course, as we all do. Um, but I look at them and think that they are by and large trying to do a complex job in a good way. And so given how difficult it is, I suspect caution because of the moving parts and the risks around it. Um, and they could engineer whatever landing you want. They could, they could certainly over um, um, restrict monetary conditions causing both an asset and an inflation and a reset. Uh, in the goal of taming goods inflation create an asset deflation and a economic downturn, recession possibly. And at the same time, they could um, fail to address the problems that they're faced adequately, and we could have more inflation for longer. Um, but let me step back and say that um, the interest rate hikes that are priced seem fine. Um, you know, is it going to be seven? Is it going to be four? Is it, I, I like at this point, given that 50 is on the table um, at any meeting, in my opinion. Um, I like to think in basis points, is it 125 basis points? Is it 200 basis points? I, I, I'm not, I think it's by and large fine. What isn't clear is, um, and I wrote about this in December in something called um, the drum beats of QT. On December 15th, there was a Fed, Fed presser, meeting and presser, and in that presser, um, Jay Powell mentioned that they had been looking at the balance sheet. And at that point I tweeted, I think I was the first to notice it. There were not that many people that did notice it, but QT was a game changer. Um, and in de late December, I wrote my thoughts up about that and said that as long as the drumbeat of QT is, occurs and gets louder, and then finally when QT actually occurs, asset prices are gonna have quite a bit of difficulty. Unfortunately, I've been buying the dip along the way, ignoring my own advice, um, though that's working out fine for the year, um, not the buying the dip part, that's still not working out. Um, but um, I do think as we, as we look at where asset prices have come, which is bonds are lower, equities are lower, commodities are higher, gold is higher. <coughs> Risk premium expansion is what QT will cause. And what that means is that that portfolio that I described of beta 
is going to get cheaper across the board. Yesterday, we saw every asset class fall. That's what QT does. And that's what QE did in reverse. Asset inflation is what QE creates. Asset deflation is what QT creates. Neither of the, the wealth effect of those things has a, my, a weak impact on consumer prices, but isn't the way to fight consumer price inflation or deflation. Why did they do QE? Because they didn't have rates to cut. Rates were already zero. So they had to come up with something that would have an impact on goods. But it's only through the wealth effect and the wealth effect only happens when wealthy people with this newfound asset holders who aren't by and large wealthy people sell and consume. And it's weak. And similarly, those same rich people who will see QT affect their asset portfolio, will it affect their marginal spending not much? Probably not much. And so it's important to know that QT and QE are not good levers for inflation. QE was used because it was the only choice. In this case, QT doesn't have to be used. It will be, it doesn't have to be used because it's weak as an inflation fighter. It's strong as an asset inflation fighter, but it's weak as a goods inflation fighter through that wealth effect channel. I mean, what, what rate, you... rate rises do work and they have that tool from zero to what infinity and beyond. They have that tool. So, and the Fed has said that they will do that. So what I conclude is rates are where they are. They seem to roughly anticipate what the dot plot may look like tomorrow. We'll see if that does cool inflation. Who knows? We can come back to that. But the real important thing about the future, the second half of assets uh, for assets markets is the details of QT. So that's what I'm... Yeah, no, no, that's a really interesting. I mean, one, one challenge I found <laughs> is... So one challenge I found is that you know, the time they started to talk about QT, you know, towards the end of last year, um, uh, the policy rate expectations also picked up at the same time. So, so the market was also saying, actually, the Fed's going to hike as well. So how do you disentangle the two effects? Because it may well be actually stocks and risk markets are selling off because the market's pricing more Fed hikes. So it may not be the balance sheet. You know, the, so, so the QT may be working through a stingling me mechanism for future policy rate hikes rather than a portfolio effect. It, that's true. And you can't. It's not that yeah. simple that you can ascribe. And, and people try to do that. Like, I saw some ridiculous analysis that indicated that, um, I don't want to quote it wrong. I think there was like, QT was going to generate 250 basis points increase all up without, but for QT in 10-year notes, um, which... I, I just, you know, that's yeah. wacky in terms of what the long history of, of 10 year notes impact would be. It, anything's possible, but I don't think that one is. Um, so, connecting how much QT means in terms of how, you know, what is the amount of QT that would generate 25 basis points of hikes and vice versa, and what those things would do to asset markets is not something I can call quantify well, and I don't think it's quantifiable, and there are lots of models to do it. What I think is true is that um, QT is a pressure. And when you think about assets and you say, do you want to own assets when the um, treasury is financing, remember QT, all that happens is that in the first phase, which is roll off, all that happens is the treasury, the Fed gets a maturity payment then they don't have any more bond. Um, what they had been doing and what they're still doing is reinvesting that maturity payment. And so they're buying a bond. What, the, what they will do um, during roll off is they won't buy a bond. They'll just burn the cash essentially. Um, and um, the cash has to come from somewhere and that's gonna come from the treasury issuing a new bond and having somebody else buy it. And so that process is going to result in people who are happy with their portfolio right now having to say, um, 
I'm willing to lever up my per portfolio, risk up my portfolio to buy some of these bonds that are now in the market. And that competes with all the things they own. And they're going to choose the things they want to sell based on that. And that's a pressure. And um, the last, it, it's been front run. Um, certainly part of the price, I don't know how much, but part of the price action between January when the minutes woke everyone to the drum beats of QT um, to today, um, part of that has been front running people by people who say, um, I don't want to compete with this issuance, so I'm going to sell now. Yeah. And, um, and, and then there'll be the actual issuance, and that'll create its own headwind. The question is what's discounted and whether what portfolios look like now, are they prepared to absorb what could be a trillion dollars of more supply over the course of the next, um, the, you know, the 12 months following QT's announcement? And yeah. I don't know the answer to that. It is a pressure. And you, you mentioned, you know, with QT and all these pressures, risk premium has uh, increased. Um, so what we've seen is like PE ratios have fallen quite noticeably. For which is exactly around. the inverse of that, right? Yeah, which is the inverse of that, you know, which, which, which fits into that sort of thesis. So, so on the valuation side, you know, many people were complaining that, you know, stocks are too expensive and so on. But now, I mean, how do you look at stock valuations? I mean, now are we at levels which... Where, where valuations are attractive or, or not, or is, is, you know, or is it simply a case of value is no longer a factor um, not to be worried about, so it's neutral? Right, so I, I mean, I think stepping back, valuation matters, but not, it's not a, um, something that standalone is a trading signal. You yeah. can't make money having with a valuation model in markets. There's too much volatility associated with expectation. There's the potential you could be wrong, um, all sorts of things. It's very difficult to make money on valuations. Um, however, um, valuations are something I still have in my quiver. And I use an approach that so PE is bad for a variety of reasons, but the, the thing that bothers me most about PE is that it doesn't um, scale with interest rates. So in normal interest rate environments, Europe and Japan are a different beast, but in normal interest rate environments, when interest rates fall um, are at a lower level, PEs should be at a higher level all else being equal. Now interest rates fall for different reasons, but <clears throat> comparing the PE, for instance, of stocks today versus the PE of stocks when interest rates were at 6%, I would assume simply from discounted cash flow analysis um, that the, PV, the present value of future earnings in lower interest rates is higher than those same, that same earnings stream in higher interest rates environments. So the P would be higher for the same E. Um, and so I, my rough heuristic for, you know, for you know, the, the quick and dirty is to look at long-term interest rates, nominal interest rates. There's lots of different discussions on that. Nominal interest rates versus earnings yield. Um, earnings yield being the inverse of PE. Um, and see how that plays out through time. And right now we're, you know, not super cheap, not obviously rich. Um, we're in a range that makes sense to me. You know, my models are saying, you know, we're the, the, that model says that, you know, between 4,500 and 4,600 is probably fair value. Yeah. And, and do you have a view on valuation, say, on Europe or China? Because their, their valuations seem more attractive. Yeah, China's not my lane. I can't speak okay. intelligently about that at all. The problem with Europe is very straightforward. Um, any analysis that looks at valuation, particularly one that takes interest rates into account, would show that um, Europe or Europe, European stocks are cheap. Um, but I think that's because um, European financial conditions are actually extremely tight relative to the United States. Um, and what I mean by that is people say, well, the interest rates are negative. How could you be, how could that be true? 
And that's because um, the level of interest rates is not what's important to determine monetary tightness or, or ease. You can have very tight monetary conditions at 2% yields and very easy monetary conditions at 10% yields. Um, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah. Really why that is, is because when the Fed sets its interest rate, if 2% is the interest rate and without the Fed, it would be one and a half percent, meaning if the Fed didn't set interest rates at 2%, but the demand for loans was actually only going to clear the market at one and a half percent, that would be tight monetary conditions because no one would borrow when the right market was one and a half, but the Fed set it artificially high. And similarly, if um, at 10%, the Fed set interest rates, and what really was the market clearing price was 11%, there would be tremendous appetite to lend at 10%, which would be very accommodative because they would normally lend at 11, but the Fed is offering them this bump, this great deal at 10. And how do you and go so, about measuring this? Like, how do you then, I mean, how, how do you determine what the Sort of the, the non-central bank influence market clearing rate is or or infer yeah, that I mean, it is lots of ways, there's lots of ways to do it. Financial conditions indexes are a popular way. Some of those are coincidental because they depend a lot on market prices. Some of them are predictive. My own strategy is to look at the availability of money and credit, which is savings and the ability to lever, compared to the need, by the, the supply, the first thing is the demand, the supply of financial assets. And when there's supply is high, monetary conditions are easy. And when money is hot, sorry, when the supply is low, when there's not a lot of bonds around or not a lot of stocks around, um, financial conditions are easy. And when, when money and credit is free, anyone can borrow, no matter what their standards are, um, financial conditions are easy. And so I tend to look at those things. And when um, there's no, but like 2008, banks wouldn't lend. So monetary, there was no credit available. And so monetary conditions were very tight, even though rates were very low. Um, and so I look at it at that macro level, as well as, you know, market pricing, which tends to be coincident and not predictive. And then what's likely to change and how that is likely to change. And that's how I, my process. Yeah. And, you know, just, just bring this back to the US. Also, I mean, anyway, back to Europe. The yeah. reason why I think Europe is in a difficult situation is because negative interest rates were not negative enough in that framework, okay. are not negative enough to be stimulative. Yeah. And so if you have a tight, tighter than it should be monetary condition, risk premiums are going to be higher. Valuations are going to be lower. PEs, the inverse of risk premiums are going to be lower. And so it's not that cheap. What you have to do is get real easing. And that can happen fiscally, or it can happen through QE, um, or it can happen through interest rates. Those are the levers. Europe can't pull the fiscal side because it's not a fiscal union and interest rates are near zero or negative. And um, QE is, seems to be on its way out. Um, Japan is an interesting case. Same thing applies. Rates that just never got negative enough. They never did QE in an adequate way. They did a ton of it, but it wasn't enough. So valuations are cheap. But Japan seems willing and able to, um, they cut, cut out the middleman and buy stocks. They're willing to do that. That directly hit, hits the wealth effect without having to go through this convoluted purchase of bonds. If they were to do what they did in 2015, which is they call the three arrows, um, combination of structural reform, which may or may not ever have happened, but monetary easing and fiscal spending, they could ignite the Japanese economy, which by far is the worst performing 
economy. <coughs> we'll see if they do. The BOJ meets later, later this week, I think, yeah. Um, we'll see if they do. The yen is acting like they might um, be easier in the meeting than expectations. Um, but they could, you know, fire three missiles. Arrows aren't going to do it anymore to help their economy. And that could significantly impact Japanese stocks and the yen, depreciate the yen, rally the Japanese market. Um, and we'll see. Um, they are, of course, speaking the same language as everybody else around inflation, but they're the ones that are, if you want to think about stagflation, they're the ones that are most at risk for that. And they have no tools except on the fiscal side to uh, fight that. <coughs> yeah. And we, we haven't uh, explicitly talked about the, the Russia-Ukraine situation. When, when an event like that happens, you know, commodity prices have, you know, shot up. Recently, they've fallen back down again. But how, how do you incorporate that into your, your view? Uh, terrible, terrible loss of life, terrible um, impact on society, potential scary implications associated with escalations both within your, Ukraine toward um, you know, weapons of mass destruction and certainly escalating outside the borders of Ukraine um, are all things to, that we all think about. Um, as it relates to markets, I would be um, um, less concerned. Um, the impact on global trade, the impact on global asset prices, the impact on the US economy in particular, um, sure, um, it's um, short-term inflationary, um, but these things tend to, um, like oil, go up and go down, and we'll see. Um, but um, without being crass, I'd like to say it's mostly noise. Okay. Um, not insensitive to what's happening there, yeah. but um, um, more a source of alpha for me than a source of, of, of than a signal. Yeah. And, and, you know, we touched on early inflation. I mean, do, do you have, you know, a kind of a core view on the inflation regime that we're in? There's a big debate in the market around, you know, is this transitory as in a couple of years, even transitory? And, you know, are we going back to the seventies or something, or are we sure. going to return back to the type of low inflation regime we had before the pandemic? Sure. Um, I'll tell you what I wrote um, in, um, February of 2021, um, I said inflation is, is why inflation is um, um, likely to be transitory. Um, I wrote that it would take, you know, between now then and, you know, late half, late 2022 before inflation pressures ebb. Um, and so, I still use that word that people don't like to use, but I still think um, that's by and large true. Um, and I think the world is still trying to get comfortable with the idea of a one-time price increase, and that one time may take a year and a half, versus ongoing year over year over year price increases. Um, and what I think that requires, that second thing requires, is um, somebody willing to lever up year after year after year. Because simple, it requires more consumption to generate more price increases. And so, um, I'm ignoring the supply chain challenges. We can come back to that if you want, but um, it just doesn't seem to me that the um, either at the government debt level or at the private sector level, both corporations and individuals, that successive levering up is a, a likely response over the next 10 years, given the level of debts. And so that principal driver to me of levering up to buy um, 
um, isn't present. Plus there's a demographic issue regarding demand, which is um, secular, which continues to be <clears throat> negative for inflation. Um, and then there's supplies and supply constraints are um, gonna resolve one day, I don't know when. But then there's the Fed and central bankers and the regular actions of demand curtailment that occurs when both interest rates and prices are going up. Um, and so if they wanna fight inflation, they're gonna win is my basic point. And, and on the secular inflation, on the secular inflation yeah. side, I mean, what one um, kind of spin here is the whole energy transition issue, where there's a move away from fossil fuels. So that potentially is a additional cost in some ways. Where you're, you're kind of introducing a price for an externality, carbon price implicitly in some ways, um, and then also that's also a potential source of government spending, um, and even sure. corporates could spend. Yeah, I think that, that I think ESG is. I think you have ESG has to take its fair share of of responsibility for what's happened. Um, certainly, the trend to divest of energy assets that started years ago, but really came in hard in um, the last few, um, has made financing difficult to get for um, building infrastructure in the oil and gas industry, and that's impacted. Um, supply. And I don't think that's necessarily going to change anytime soon. We'll see. Um, there are very good reasons why somebody who believes that the environment is under threat would like to see oil prices higher because that would cause the transition. Um, so I think that supply constraint from oil is um, probably going to stick with us for a long time. Um, at the same time, there's a demand problem, and I think this is what you were alluding to regarding um, government spending, which is um, sustainable um, energy sources require um, minerals that are in short supply already. Conductive minerals, rare earth minerals, battery components, all of the various things that one needs to have a electric and sustainable, whether it's wind or solar, um, source of energy and storage. Um, and so that demand, this, that demand is likely to persist. And so um, those things are, you know, that I agree, I think that those are, um, are have become secular. Um, we'll see, but they, they certainly are there for sure. And, and do you have any you know, how are you positioned at the moment uh, in this market? Do you have any sure. sort of favorite trades or views at the moment? Right. So I'm really, um, I've been far more active in all the various markets that I trade than normal over the last few mo months, principally because markets are moving the amount that I might expect in um, a month in a day. And so that's caused some more rapid trading than I'm used to. I generally trade around 40 times a year across various asset classes. I'm probably going at one and a half times that right now. Um, I am, uh, I just bought the bond market, the 10 year note um, yesterday. Um, I, uh, after being, um, after trading back and forth through that whole mortgage convexity thing, I just bought that. Um, two days ago I bought, sorry, uh, about a week ago, I bought um, puts on the yen when it was around 116.9, um, expecting it to tick at 120. Um, I also bought Nikkei based on my um, a couple of things, including something I wrote about regarding auto callables and the impact of those on the market. Um, Nikkei upside. Um, I'm short the euro. I've been strategically short the euro for a long time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I continue to own SPX and NDX, which my current position is April um, 4,400 strikes on the SPX and uh, approximately, I don't ever disclose what exactly I'm doing, but call it that. And NDX spreads about 
four or five percent out of the money struck you know another three percent uh, overwritten on those like 14 5 16, what's the rationale 15, for, for the equity position the long us equity position here um well is it is it kind been, of like a tactical view it's been, it's, more... it's, been, it's been wrong for a long time for all, all quarter so um that's an excellent question the answer to that is that i believe that the nominal growth um combination of 2% GDP growth for the year and at least 4% inflation will generate large nominal growth and that equities are a nominal asset and um, that'll generate, and they have operating leverage in that some of their costs are fixed and don't fluctuate with inflation, generating earnings growth that's above expectations. So there's an okay. earnings level, that's an earnings level thing. And I think that the, the, the window is closing between details on QT, some responses that, the, that I'm following regarding how the treasury will act during QT. <clears throat> that headwind is worrisome, but at the same time, risk premiums have expanded a lot. So I think between now, partly due to March month year end, sorry, month quarter, monthly and quarterly um, end, um, and um, what I think is fairly aggressive hawkishness, both for QT and equity and um, and um, rate hikes, that we could see a relief rally that takes us to my targets of 4,500 to 4,600 um, before these options in April expire. And yeah. then we'll see about how these the QT plays out. I could imagine being bullish or bearish depending on those details. Yeah, understood. Okay, so these are your main your main. One last thing is I also uh, the one last thing is I we're talking about commodities. Yeah, one of my favorite trades has been um, adding to starting and adding as the as this relationship went crazy the last few days. Um, short uh, short dated oil. I happen to use June um, and long um, three year oil. Um, and uh, that spread, that backwardation is um, 30 points, right? I, I haven't looked today, but let's call it 30 points where you can sell um, three month oil for 100 and buy um, three year oil for 70. And given all the things we said, I think three year oil at 70 is a gift. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm hedging it by shorting front month oil. If it flat, if the if the backwardation flattens out some in either direction, I'm sure I'll take that off. But right now, that's been uh, that's one of my favorite ways to express a longer term secular um, and value um, relationship in oil. Yeah, no, I like that trade. Yeah, okay, so that's uh, that, that's great. I mean, I do like to round off our conversation with a few personal questions. So one is, what's what's the best investment advice you've ever received? giving a lot of investment advice, whether people like it or not. Um, I, I would say the um, all weather framework is probably the most valuable thing. And that that is number one. Number two would be, I, I know you asked me for one, but that would be number one. Number two would be that you probably don't have alpha. Okay. 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 That's uh, quite sobering there, but important to remember for the average investor. Um, and then on, on time management and productivity, obviously you, you mentioned earlier that when you were on the buy side, you had a strategy to manage your information flow. I mean, what's your, do you have a system now? I don't. I'm, I'm fairly prolific on Twitter. I'm researching 24 seven. My kids have grown up. So <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, my kids have grown up, so I'm. Um, I have plenty of time, um, and you know I do exercise and do things like that, and cook and have hobbies. But by and large, um, turned on to the market twenty four seven. Wake up thinking about it, and um, right now I'm trying to be a sieve distiller and synthesizer for my clients, and um, just loving that experience right now. Okay, great. Being a content creator is very different than being a, 
um, exclusively a position, uh, um, a portfolio manager. Yeah. And uh, I see you have lots of books behind you. Uh, are there any books that have really influenced you uh, over your well, those career? Are cook, those, are, those are all cookbooks. Oh, and okay. Every, and <laughs> oh, many, I can see Noma, Noma over there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> many, many of them um, uh, have had big influences. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I've always been a fan of reminiscences of a stock operator. But I've read all the 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 the, the um, texts, the Fabozzi, the um, Hull, the Graham Dodd. Uh, I'm sorry, Graham Ben Graham's book. Um, a lot of Ray's stuff, um, and then you know, sort of, you know, liars poker and things like that that gave you a sense of the cultures of yeah of of years that we've gone through. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I study it all. Okay, great. I also that's like reading about history too. Okay, no, that's great. No, that's good to know. And um, uh, if people wanted to follow you, uh, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, so my Twitter handle, which is is um, becoming, you know, has grown from five hundred to thirty thousand people in this the last year, um, is the best way. It's at Damp Spring. I also have a website which offers some more um, content um, called, um, that's also called dampspring.com. Um, and I have some um, client paid um, models, both for institutions and for high net worth and for people who just want to learn more about markets that are available on that website. So I'd go to follow me on Twitter at Dampspring and go to dampspring.com to, you know, see the rest of the things I offer. That's great. I'll, I'll include links to all of those as well. Just one question, Dampspring, where, where does that name come from? Or why, why? So Dampspring is a physical system. Ah, okay. Um, this is your engineering, you know. That's engineering. <laughs> and, yeah, um, you know, that's for another conversation, but um, it's uh, basically the way I conceptually only, this is not a practical model, but conceptually um, look at the world in terms of, 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 of springs, which cause, which depending on their tuning, create volatility when uh, a, the system is shocked with news um, and dampers, which tend to, or shock absorbers, which tend to uh -huh. quell that volatility. And so by understanding the the, the springs, what makes financial conditions, investors more likely to respond violently or less violently or ignore or whatever, the tightness of the spring, so to speak. And then what, you know, people like things like circuit breakers and um, counter cyclical policy maker activity um, results in the damper. And so I have a conceptual model that I use to, you know, think about future uh, current conditions and what that might mean for the path one takes from one equilibrium state to another as news um, as news hits the market. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, that's, that's a nice story there. Okay, so with that, I mean, it's, it's been great speaking to you and I do urge people to follow Andy on Twitter. I'll include the links and everything and, and to sign up to, uh, to the service as well. So once again, thank you very much, Andy. Thanks, Paul, it was a pleasure.